thank you all watching this, listening to this, joining us now, joining us later, whenever you are going to be watching it. This is Darren Paltrowitz, host of the Paltrowcast of Darren Paltrowitz, joined by two exquisite authors and musicians. And by that, I mean, they are authors who are musicians. You, you don't get a lot of authors who are musicians, musicians who are authors and do both very well. But in this case, we do and we have. And those would happen to be these two gentlemen pictured beside me, uh, beneath, uh, we got Paul Myers. Hi. We have S.W. Loudon. And be be before I just shower with more compliments and praise here, I mean, they've written a couple of excellent books like this one and this one. Uh, as I was telling Paul before we started recording, Paul wrote this great book. Uh, S.W. Loudon, he's the editor of Forbidden Beat, Perspectives on Punk, Drumming. Uh, hey, he's got a punk rock PI character series, Greg Salem. We're going to hear about all that, but gentlemen, everything good, right? Thumbs up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good to be here. Nothing Thanks for but, having us. Yeah, as David Lee Roth would say. Uh, how did you two meet? Should I throw that one at Mr. S.W. Loudon first? How did you two first connect? Well, it, it's funny. We actually got connected by our publisher, Tyson Cornell, who is himself a musician who runs a really cool publishing company out of Los Angeles called Rare Bird Books. Um, Paul had worked with him on a previous project. I believe it was essays around the band. Yes. And those and, essays about progressive rock. Yeah. Yeah. About yeah. progressive rock. Yes, and uh, yeah. Rare Bird had also published my Greg Salem punk rock PI trilogy, yeah. um, which was crime fiction about a punk singer uh, based in Hermosa Beach. And when I got to the end of that trilogy, he was like, you know, what's next? And, and because we were connected around music, we kind of started talking about maybe doing some nonfiction work. And when I found out that he and Paul had kind of started a power pop project, I kind of joined the team and it was really off to the races. But I should say, and I think this is really interesting, Paul and I have now done two books together and we've never been in the same room. Yeah. You know That's what? True. My second book, I've never been in the same room with that author. You're not alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I also, uh, I also, another book I worked on, I didn't meet the editorial staff uh, I, until uh, at, way after it had come out. I went to England for the, it was an English, the, the Todd Rungren book, actually. I went to England and I was like, I'd really love to meet the team. You know, I was in England. I said, I I'd like to come over and meet you guys. You know, this is pre-COVID, so it was pretty easy to do. But it was sure. it, it is funny because you just get so used to dealing remotely with everybody, even before the COVID days. Like, um, I just want to add that. So I had done this. So, um, I'd written an essay for Tyson's previous book. It was called. Um, uh, what's it called? Yes is the answer. Yes is the answer. And uh, as basically essays. And I love this idea that I, I as far as I know, Tyson came up with to take a bunch of essays that are, are more literary than necessarily rock journalism, but sometimes it overlaps, and to take impressions of an aspect of that subject, of that genre, if you will, or subgenre, mm -hmm. and then and then make a kind of a literary, a book that's all about the writing rather than necessarily just like a CD with liner notes. And he asked me to do something, and I did this thing about basically growing up the summer that punk rock came in, uh, I was a progressive rock kid and then punk rock and new wave started happening. It, was, it ends up being a coming of age story. And I was really into it. And I thought anthologies, because you can write one story and be part of a bigger picture. And it's kind of like, a, it's neat. And then I said, we should do this again, but do it with power pop, because that was an area that I kept coming up to people's experiences. And it's hard to define, and it still is. And Definitely. we love having that yes. conversation. And then I kind of got stalled. I wanted it to be as literary as it could be. We had Michael Chabon uh, writing about more or less Big Star and, and the sort of undertone darkness of pop. And then and then it kind of stalled because I kept thinking, let's get all the big guys. Let's get all the, J you know, all the Franzens and the Zadie Smiths. And, and as it turns out, it's very hard to get people either to admit that they like power pop or yes. the, to, to, you know, give you a good story. Then we started to think, well, why don't we just get people who want to write about stuff then it got stalled. And then he said, Steve wants to do something like this. Let's get that together. And then we met on uh, on one of these things is one of these Zoom links. And uh, we started talking, we kind of pulled our resources and started putting out feelers. And it was really kind of who we thought we should bring in. And then other people came forward. And then once the book came out, uh, and it did really well for I think for what it is, it did incredibly well. 
And, and we were like, oh, all these people kept coming up to us now that they knew we did this. And they were like, oh my God, why didn't we ask that person? And, and, and some people were like, actually like, why didn't you ask me? Like, and I, I'm like, we were just making it up. So we had enough stories left over that we could do a half another book. And then we just started putting out the feelers. Have I got the right, Steve? Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. right. It was, it was a really good feeling when people started approaching us, it sort of validation that what we had put together kind of resonated with core Power Pop fans. Yeah, Power Pop, as you just pointed out, is a polarizing genre and name. And the weird part about the whole thing is it should be the most accessible thing that there is because Power Pop is rooted in, well, my perspective and definition on it, it's sing-along choruses, guitar and or piano parts that are catchy. It's catchy, it's accessible, it's melodic, yet it's so polarizing. And one of the weird parts about it is I know artists who are Power Pop artists who hate being called power pop. <laughs> you know, can you think of a more self-loathing genre or form yeah. of entertainment than power pop? I can't. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that, right? Because Marco DeSantis, who is a friend of ours in common, um, yeah. who was from the band Sugar Cult, his whole essay in, in Go All The Way is called Surrender. Um, and he's talking about how basically Sugar Cult was a power pop band, at least when they started, more so than pop punk, which is where they ended up. But they always kind of denied it because they thought it was going to be a kiss of death from a career perspective, that either the record labels wouldn't take them seriously because there's so much baggage and damage around the term power pop, or that younger fans wouldn't have any context for power pop and think it was old music. And so he writes the essay about the trajectory of their incredible career and then admits at the end of all of it, OK, we were probably a power pop fan the whole time. <laughs> right. Now, Paul was talking about prog rock before. I think Paul might be the first person I've ever encountered who is a power pop guy who didn't start out on metal or hard rock first and then That's go into power pop. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, I, you know, I, for what it's worth, I'm, I'll just admit I'm 61 years old. So one of my first bands played uh, Kiss Covers, Bachman Turner Overdrive. I'm from Toronto. So Bachman Turner yeah. Overdrive was very, uh, we were very proud of them as Canadians. Uh, we played. Be. Yes. Yeah. And we played some Rush covers, but let's be honest, it was the ones we could play at 16. <laughs> uh, so we played like In the Mood by Rush and we played uh, Fly By Night by Rush. By you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's one of the first suspension songs I remember learning on the D suspended chord. And, uh, you know, Alex Lifeson was kind of my role model for a lot of things when I was first started soloing. And I, but I had eschewed my early Beatles influence, which I thought at that point was like, oh, that stuff I liked when I was a kid. And then, and then I started playing this sort of rock you know, I guess it would be pop rock and roll, but you know, kiss all, rock and roll all night is a, a great song to play when you're a kid. And yeah. it's probably still a great song to play again now that I'm 61, frankly, but, um, and you know, strutter and all those songs. And we did like harmony lead solos, like can't get enough by bad finger and stuff like that. And bad company. Sorry. Oh my God. It's like power pop well, on my head. There yeah. were two bad bands. It's not too far off to confuse bad yeah. finger and bad company. Wink, wink. No, no, no. Yeah. But anyway, so but my point about that was I really wanted to be like a, a Jeff Beck type lead guitar player. But then I started writing like melodically and then New Wave happened. And then I was in a punk Rocky band that had big block chords. But I still wanted to write songs that had hooks. And then I heard I think I might have heard like Starry Eyes by the records or something. And then. And I and of course, the raspberries were around on the radio. And I thought, you know, I, and I can be honest about this. I think the raspberries go all the way. It's about the intro. But I actually, frankly, find the verse is kind of cloying. But the chorus and the and the intro are fantastic to me. But that intro, especially the, you know, the bow, 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 oh, yeah. Yeah. And like that is like that. And of course, Paul Stanley took a note from that, too. So uh -huh. I started to feel where the kiss overlapped with the power pop and then I heard Bram Tchaikovsky when the new wave started happening and the records and, uh, and, you know, and the motors and all. And that's when I went, Oh, there's a whole thing here. Anyway, so that's what happened to me. That's how I got there through rock and roll. And the prog thing was in the middle somewhere. Um, one of my bands started getting more and more into writing adventurous originals. Genesis had, had entered the chat and uh, yes, again, Genesis and yes, were bands that we couldn't play, but we tried to play like complicated songs with seven seven, eight time signatures and stuff, Yeah, you know, anyway. It's funny, Darren, you know, the, the, you mentioned coming into the hard rock door. Like I had older brothers who were heavy metal dudes who like, I would roadie for them and their heavy metal band on the sunset strip when I was like 14 years old. So I got wow. to go into these clubs and stuff. 
Wow. Um, and they played a lot of classic rock and heavy metal for me. And then I discovered punk rock in the early 80s. And that was sort of my music, my self-expression. I was kind of free of the tyranny of, of heavy metal and, and classic rock. And so I came to Power Pop really very much through English punk rock and post-punk bands like The Jam and Generation X and Buzzcocks, you know, and what I realized was, is I, I liked the energy. I mean, I grew up in the town where like Descendants and Black Flag are from, right? So like that was in the mix too, but I was always the kind of the guy who was like, yeah, but I really like that hook and, the, and those choruses are pretty good good and and uh, so i kind of ended up at power pop but i came in through the punk door definitely yeah to echo what you're saying i remember when i saw your band live in the early 2000s and your band sar am, am i saying that wrong t-s-a-r sar you say it differently you say czar it's czar it's okay. it's just another spelling of c-z-a-r and the reason we're called t-s-a-r is we're all super avid crossword puzzle people and that's <laughs> one that comes up a lot in crossword puzzles <laughs> Well, I owned your records, but always said your band name wrong for 20 years. That's what I'm learning right now. So when I saw Czar in the early 2000s, your singer said something along the lines of this next song. Uh, we're going to take a vote here. Do you want to hear us cover the Dead Boys or the Backstreet Boys? And yep. then, of course, everyone would go Backstreet Boys, and then you'd cover the Backstreet Boys per se. But the fact that he was referencing the Dead Boys goes, yep, there's punk. Yeah. No, that that we did that Dead Boys song a lot, but actually people really responded to our version of Larger Than Life a <laughs> lot more. And we actually recorded it for a college only EP. It's it's I I've, I listened to it probably in the last couple of years. It stands up. It's funny, you know, to do the Backstreet Boys like that. Yeah, well, I'm sure Max Martin, who wrote a lot of those Backstreet Boys, I'm sure he was a power pop guy, just not outwardly would want to say that because didn't he start off as a metal guy in Sweden? before what? i'm putting you on the spot here it wouldn't you surprise me uh you know uh, it's funny because one of the guys who writes in our second edition is uh dave hill and dave hill's a comedian but he's also an incredible guitar player and a shredder and he loves and he loves death uh yeah it's in the go further he writes this uh, story called glitter and glue yeah. and for him you know he does the theme from last week tonight by john oliver which is yes. a, to me it's an outright power pop tune but he he can shred and he's got a death metal band on the side. And he's got this other hard rock band, but he also has yeah. Valley Lodge, which is more of a traditional power pop band. Yes. And and so he's a great example of where if you have a sense of melody and you know how to shred, you probably find this this current. You know, it's like a wave you can surf because you're 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 uh, welcome so many places and so many places please you. And I guess having an open mind. Right. Like. Music's music. So at some point, we don't really want to genreize ourselves out of crossing waters, you know, maybe. Yeah. I, it's, I, I think you just described Butch Walker really accurately as well as another guy who's a shredding guitar player, but has a really great ear for pop hooks. Um, and I think Marvelous 3 really is that the, your definition of Dave Hill's music, I think, really fits Marvelous 3 and what Butch Walker's been able to do with his career as well. And he writes a whole thing about being in Marvelous 3 for our second edition as well. You, something you guys have in common with Dave Hill is how do you describe that guy? Because Dave is a brilliant comedian. He's an excellent comic. If anyone ever gets to see him live, he's a great writer. He's a great musician. He's a great shredding kind of guitar player. What <laughs> is he? How do you describe Dave Hill? And I say the same right. about both of you because talented musicians with great books, but and it's an interesting kind. kind of approach that you take with these books where you're kind of curators. You know as much Absolutely. as the people who are contributing to your books per se, but you're also letting them speak it. Now, what I the, the curious thought I have, it's such an undertaking to get other people to meet deadlines for things that they're doing on spec per se. <laughs> so when we see a book that has 20 or 30 contributors to it, did you pare it down from like, let's ask these 50 people and hope that 20 to 30 come back in? Or did you really get one for one that everybody contributed? There were some people that dropped out. Steve, you want to maybe talk? I would just say this quickly, that the uh, the list of people we get, then people just eventually drop out, like they get a deadline on something else. And there's yeah. a few authors that I had invited who said they would do it. And then they called me back and said, you know, I don't think I'm going to make it. So, and then... You know, but we also over asked at one point, just knowing that there's a certain amount of people who will drop out. 
but Steve, what was your experience? Because you had a whole, we also split up into teams to get these authors. That's why I'm uh, referring to Steve. Yeah. yeah. And we have I meetings mean, to discuss it, but we basically yeah. delegate. You know, there was the like, we want to make sure the book in either volume touches on this or touches on that, or we should probably have something about this band or this scene, or let's make sure it's not all American bands or, you know, just down the line, you kind of put some guardrails in place. And then what Paul and I did better on the second book than we did on the first book um, was we would come up with a list of 10 and chunk them out and then ask those 10. And then when we got six responses out of that, then we would come up with the list of the next 10 or the next five. And yeah. so because we also had to make sure we didn't go back to our publisher and go, great news, there's 900 contributors because, you know, the yeah. book would be like this big and the printing costs would be terrible. So we, we just did it in little, little waves, always making sure that the quality was there and that enough eras and countries and voices were being covered so that we felt comfortable about the mix. Wow. Okay. So this format that you did for both of these books, when I started thinking, okay, my third book, uh, I'm going to start writing it. And I saw the format of your books. I went, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get some experts write essays. And then I started reaching out to a couple of people and I went, wow, I don't trust any of these people to meet deadlines. And uh, <laughs> everyone's going to say yes, and then not actually deliver essays per se. The contributions that you got, did you have to rewrite or is it pretty much what you see is what you get because you wanted to give the people's voices? Oh, we definitely edit. We tell them yeah. what we're going to edit because we want there to be cohesion in terms of tone and, and silly stylistic things like, do you capitalize the before a band name or do you not yeah. capitalize yes, the? And, so, the and somebody edits us too. Like yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a copy editor who also makes sure that we're consistent. And yeah. I still don't understand which one we use, Power Pop, Capital or not, but I know Lower it gets case. sorted hyphen. out. Lowercase, okay. <laughs> Lowercase and or the hyphen. Has yes. been a, a complex thing, or is it two words? Is it one word? Yeah, you know some some writers like we had Dave Holmes write about Tommy Keen, and Dave Holmes, you don't have to tell him what to do. Like D D Dave Holmes writes for you know Esquire and various other things, and he knows he knows how to deliver what we call a clean copy, you know. And as same with Annie Zaleski, who writes about jellyfish. And uh, but then there's some like the filmmaker B Balin Schneider, who's made a film about material issue. He really, I don't know what his history is with writing, but he definitely came to me like, what do I do? Uh, like, how do I tell this? And I said, just write it in your own voice and I'll let you know if we need more or less. And then he would keep coming back with new versions. And at one point I made a whole bunch of suggestions and he took about five out of 10. And uh, at that point, it, you know that at least they're considered. And I, you know, there's, you don't have to tell people how to write. You just have to give them suggestions. You know, we're just I don't know about Steve, but I'm just learning how to be an editor editor, you know, but but I think because we both do write, we sort of know, you know, you Steve, you're probably like this, like you, you can look at somebody's somebody writes you a letter and uh, says, I'm going to send this off. And do they ever like, people ask me all the time, is this flow right? And you go, well, yeah. this would be tighter if you did this and you repeated the word beyond five times. And you notice things as a writer and as an editor that the writer might not, especially if they're early in their writing skills. Yeah, I'm, so not, I'm not going to name any names, but uh, on both of these books, I got completely excellent, perfect essays right out of the gate. Like this one I will name, Heather Heverleski, who's a killer writer. Oh, yeah. I didn't have to change anything, right? Because like it was perfect. It was immaculate when it came in. It was a personal story about her discovering Blondie when she was a teenager. It's excellent story. But there were other people in the book who were like musician friends who aren't writers, they'll tell you that right off the bat. And that they had some trepidation about even being part of it. Cause they're like, I have to write something. I haven't written anything since like 10th grade. Um, and I was like, just write whatever and I'll help you. And I've had a couple of people literally text me paragraphs and I was assembling them into a word document and then sending it back and going, does is, is this what you sound like? Does this sound like you? Did I inadvertently change anything? They always sign off on it, but I just thought like it's so modern to get a series of text messages with lines because they're like at an airport or a Starbucks and they're like, oh, I'm supposed to be writing this essay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've had the pleasure of doing that before. I, I will not say who I've done that for, but <laughs> the bottom line is you two are adaptable, yet the book doesn't at all read 
like it's not connected. I, I'm trying to look for the correct word here. It's so cohesive. It's so oh, on thanks. brand and on point. So well, that's, that's good to know. Thank so you. for me, I think that it connects on a few levels. If you're a power pop, uh, power pop person, if you love any of the bands that are featured in the book, if you love the people who wrote the essays, you know, you read their books, their articles, like their music, et cetera. But I don't get the vibe that there's any on your end market, marketing kind of questions to it. It was just, this is a passion project. And if it sells, awesome. I do want to say this. We had a couple of goals in mind. We, we do not want it to be considered a textbook. It's not, this is book isn't going to necessarily be held up in a classroom or a courtroom, frankly, as, as here's exactly what Power Pop is. The yeah. idea is that by painting as many shades of, the, of this impression, you will get a sense of in a collage way of where this field that is frankly read, you know, some of it's arbitrary that we call something power pop. It's a subgenre, but there's like, you know, we have Puffy Amayumi in here from Japan and uh, Andrea Warner writes a really fascinating essay, basically about racism and sexism, but within the context of this light music that Andy from Jellyfish worked with. Mm -hmm. And so that works in our book because we also have, you know, the expected stories about Big Star or the expected stories about from power pop luminaries like Ira Robbins or uh, um, Jordan Oaks, who started the first uh, power pop fanzine, Yellow Pills. And so we have the stuff that you'd expect. And then we have, you know, other stories. And we're trying we we're trying to make it like the book that Steve and I couldn't just write between the two of us. Well, we could research it, but we wanted the voices to be not ours. We're amplifying other people's voices. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I've, yeah. I've really, that's really well put, Paul. I've come to think of it as a really fantastic party where people are sitting around having a conversation about power pop and it just happens to be between two covers and a book. And, and I think nice. what's important about it too is what we put to people was, is it power pop or define power pop? And yeah. we kind of, that was all the parameters we gave them. We made sure there was no duplication on bands if you were going to cover a specific band. Yes. Um, but like- Dylan Champion, um, he wrote a whole really fantastic piece about Guided by Voices, which gets lumped into power pop a lot because, I mean, look, Robert Pollard writes really fantastic hooks. He also has written one million songs. So yes. some percentage yeah. of them are going to be power pop leaning. But he lands his, his essay that they're not a power pop band. He understands why power pop fans would like them and be drawn to them, but they're not. And same with like Kate Sullivan, writing about ELO. She's like the biggest ELO fan, fantastic writer, right? But she starts off by saying they're not an ELO fan. And then she tells, uh, they're not a power pop band. And then she tells you why over the course of the essay. And you leave there going, great, they're not power pop, but I like them more than I did before, right? And so it's just like interesting people who've been given a chance to have a perspective on a specific topic. Which Kate Sullivan was that? There's a few writer Kate Sullivans out there. Uh, Kate is a friend of mine actually going back a long time. She's written for like Rolling Stone and LA Weekly and Spin. And, and uh, I think, I can't remember who she works for now. She may work for like Jib Jab or something like that. Yeah, my college Kate Sullivan friend, mm -hmm. I think is like, the, was a Vogue editor or something like that. And I was trying to think, is that the same? No, no, she didn't like yellow in college. No, that, yeah. that can't be the same <laughs> Kate Sullivan. But, uh, <laughs> and I just want to say that Daniel Brummel's piece is, is Weezer power pop? You know, yeah. like we're asking the question more than telling you, you know, and and then other, other, other Liz Fair written about by Carrie Corrigan. Now she's really, you know, that we don't consider Liz Fair generally a power pop person, but she makes an interesting case about where, Liz Fair at that particular album she speaks of in this story, you know, she has all the hallmarks of power pop and yet it's kind of an excuse to sort of talk about how women intersect into this seemingly male ideology. That's something I was excited about in many of the uh, women voices that we had in the book, because, you know, I'm a dude. I know how bored with dudes, white dude like me can be, you know, white males, who just, you know, I, I love all the usual old cliche power pop songs, but I'm also trying to broaden and listen to Puffy and things like that. Puffy, I mean, Yumi, that is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that that is what part of this party that Steve and I threw is to bring in 
And if, if you could imagine, to take Steve's analogy, imagine an old sort of Playboy after dark party with a piano, and I go, ladies and gentlemen, uh, here's Marco DeSantis. You know, like, and he's gonna, and he gets up and thanks, man. I just want to tell you my story. And everyone's sitting around with a cocktail in their hand, and you know, passing the the talking stick around so that each person gets a chance to talk. You know, but I, I like Steve's analogy a lot. <laughs> I do too. And when you finish two of these books, is the thought. Hey, so clearly we have a fan base. Clearly we have people who respect what we do. Let's do a third one. Or is it just such a massive undertaking that you don't, you can't stomach a third one? I would, yeah, I would do it. I would do a third book, but you know, it's, I think both of us also had other projects that we were trying to get to. And so I don't think it would be like, it would be right on the heels, like go further was for go all the way. Plus, we'd have to come up with some pun on go all the yeah, way. Yeah, we're running out of goes. Go yeah. Yeah. even further. Yeah. Go three. <laughs> yeah, go, right. Go figure. Yeah. Uh, right. But, you know, yeah, I agree with what Steve's saying. Like, we, uh, like I am in the middle of, like, another book I'm writing, and uh, and I've been putting it off, frankly. So I'm, I don't know. But at the same time, you know, it's a little like editing a magazine. It's sort of independent. You know, it's a hard, well, I was going to say hard cover, but it, this one's paperback, but it's a, it's a harder version of a magazine, more like what the, in England, they used to have these things called annuals, you know, and um, I don't think we could do one every year right now, but uh, certainly if the, uh, you know, if Rare Bird's down with it, and if Steve and I are down with it, we could, uh, we could totally, uh, I, you know, I don't know how many more stories like this. And the thing, uh, the thing is, I was also wondering Steve and I will have this meeting separately, of course. I was wondering if if uh, we should take the you know this whole thing, we could expand it into like some other area that is equally you know the way that Prague was for the first Rare Bird thing, and now we have two Power Pop books. There could be whatever, just punk rock, or you know, and Steve's got this great book about drumming that you know has the same vibe to it. I didn't work on that, but you know, t- maybe you talk about your book actually. Yeah, please do. Oh. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, yeah, it's called Forbidden Beat Perspectives on Punk Drumming. Follows a similar format where I went out and I asked uh, notable music writers, notable punk musicians, and of course, punk drummers, just to talk about punk rock drumming because, you know, I'm a drummer. The fact that I discovered punk rock right around the time that I got my first drum set really made it seem like I could jump in and play drums because like the kind of music my brothers were playing for me just seemed too complicated. Like I knew at 11, I was never going to be Neil Peart. Like I just wasn't right. I, I, I have the attention of a squirrel. So it's like the idea of sitting down and practicing for eight hours a day just wasn't for me. Then yeah. like I hear the damned and I'm like, well, I could probably do that. Right. So like punk rock opened up this whole other world to me. And so like, I've been a punk fan for as long as I can remember, but as I'm reading all these books about punk rock or about music or these autobiographies or biographies about bands, there's not a lot about the drummer and specifically in punk bands in those books. Yeah. And so I was like, as a reader, there was a book I wanted to read. And so as an editor, I just put the book together myself and we ended up um, doing, it's a combination of essays by like uh, Matt Deal, who co-wrote the Butch Walker book. Um, uh, he writes about the D-beat. Um, Ira Elliott from Not A Surf, the drummer from Not A Surf, writes about yeah. proto-punk and garage rock. Um, I've, I interviewed Rat Scabies. I interviewed Mike Watt. I interviewed uh, Joey Shithead from DOA. I interviewed Fanny Diaz, Lori Barbero. And then we also had um, a lot of drummers like um, Laura Bethita Neptuna from uh, the Neptunas, which is a surf punk band. She wrote about like how Gina Shock was this ultimate inspiration for her um, and how that shaped her life and her experience with drumming. Stephen McDonald from Red Cross is in it. So like, it just gave me a chance to like talk about this subject that I'm very passionate about and let people have their voice and talk about it. And again, I think we kind of surrounded it and we're able using that collage method or that conversational method to sort of like have an interesting conversation around punk rock drumming. One of the names you just mentioned, Ira Elliott from Not A Surf. I used to sell shirts for them back in the day. Uh, oh, wow. Back, back in the dark days of Not A Surf. And whatever music book you could do next, Ira can be in that because that's a guy who, Not A Surf is a big successful band, which is wonderful, well-deserved. But do you know about his glam band from... Uh, the, the, the late 80s early 90s you do yeah yeah, yeah well or you know the, is the name 
Forbidden Beat, actually, the piece he writes, it kicks off the book because he's talking about proto-punk and garage. It starts off with uh, the Fuzz Tones are on tour with the Damned, right? And it's the early 80s, and he's in this band called the Fuzz Tones, which is part of this garage revival that's happening, sort of tied to the Paisley Underground. And they go on this European tour with the Damned. What he didn't know about the Damned was Rat Scabies, the drummer from the Damned, amazing name, Rat Scabies, oh, yeah. um, invented gobbing which is he was at a Sex Pistols show and to show his appreciation, he started spitting on the band. And that became this really big thing in punk rock. So the first night they go out to open for the damn, people are just spitting on them. And his whole piece opens with that and how like being the drummer affords you the extra distance to not get spit on like the rest of the band that's up front. Oh yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like Ira to me. <laughs> yeah. so the, yeah. real re the real reason they invented the plexiglass stage shield, right? Yes. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> that's drummers. a really good point. I, I sometimes wondered, is that for acoustics? Oh, it is. It actually, I was just kidding. But but yeah, yeah. It, it's generally to keep the hi-hat out of people's ears. <laughs> maybe yeah. some band. Like if it's Toto, you know it's for acoustics. And yeah. then if it's a punk band, it's not for acoustics. It's I kind of get the topic. sense that punks might spit on Toto. I get the sense that they might. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, one more thing about Ira, of course, he also, in our first edition, Go All The Way, he wrote uh, Putting the Pow in Power Pop, which was, you know, basically, you know, uh, the same idea as in Steve's book as an extension on that with the punk drumming. But um, but Ira is, yeah, he's down for that. And I also, he plays in Bambi Kino, right? Isn't yes. It? I've never seen them live, so... But it's I know a lot Doug, of fun. And, and Doug from Guided by Voices is in that too, right? So. And Mark Rozo from Champale, the New York Times sometimes writer. Mark Rozo, I think, is the singer of that. Yeah. Band. Yeah. So there's, so. yeah. And a, he's also in a Beatles uh, Facebook group that I'm in. <laughs> if you ever want to have a fascinating conversation about Ringo Starr, specifically yeah. Ringo Starr's drumming and the way that his drumming reverberates across all of rock and roll. Just talk to Ira for 20 minutes. So mm. deeply knowledgeable, so passionate, so smart, so well-spoken. Like I've really learned a lot and I already respected Ringo Starr, but talking to Ira, he's made me a bigger fan, which is always fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ringo, uh, by the way, I, you know, I've just been listening to the uh, remixed versions of Let It Be. And uh, you really hear like the warmth of his kick drum and it makes you realize how much he moves things around and how little he plays in certain places and just, you know, and also in other Beatles stuff, like come together when you finally listen to come yes. together, yeah. you listen to it just as a drumming piece, it, like his choices, man. Like, I, I don't think, I mean, and you know, ticket to ride and all, all those songs, he, he invents these upturned beats that work and knows when to start riding and being like straight ahead. But then he comes back to these little things. He's letting you know every minute that he's, you know, there's four Beatles here. Listen, it's not just, you know, the front guys. In fact, on this T-shirt I'm wearing, I, ha I made this. It was a, it's a custom version of a famous T-shirt. I moved Ringo up a little bit on the, on the list. It's usually John, Paul, George and Ringo. And I put Ringo third because I, I still couldn't let him get ahead of these two. But and I, I sorry to George because I love George, but I wanted Ringo to be a little higher up in the running order. So <laughs> big Ringo I think, fan. I think, too, with Ringo, like the way he fanned the hi-hats, there's an inherent swing in just his regular 4-4 four, four yes. that's really impossible to duplicate. And it adds a sort of danceability to the Beatles that I think is crucial, especially in their early songs. And yes, who is point. Ringo's modern day drummer? Who is the drummer in the all-star band? Greg, Greg Bissonette. Bissonette. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it, everything comes back to David Lee Roth in, in some way or fashion in, and steve, in steve luther of toto plays with him too so 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 we we brought toto back from the being gobbed on by the punkers so there you go yeah steve Lukather has played I, I had the pleasure of interviewing him again a couple of months ago and one of the things i asked steve Lukather, i said you know you've played on thousands of records but i'm sure you turned down a lot of stuff there's a lot of stuff we don't know about you and he's like oh yeah uh i turned down being in elton john's band i turned down being in miles davis's band i turned up <laughs> and he's just like naming all these wow. things wow. Yeah. so i think your next book might if it's not power pop volume three it'll be uh, the book of lukather just and yeah the book of luke luke <laughs> like the gospel according to luke yeah yes. <laughs> The Gospel According yeah, the, to Luke, Volume Two. Well, you know he's got the stories. I mean, uh, the, the only thing I will say is, whenever you get a like a, an extended interview with Steve Lukather, 
Um, the stories are very long, and they, but they're all filled yeah. with amazing people. Like, you know, well, I was doing this session for Michael Jackson, and then Eddie Van Halen's there. You sound exactly like him. That's a good Lukather uh, I, I channel Steve Lukather in my nightclub act, <laughs> but that's... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we all know, and I turn around and I come back with a little wig on and I'm Steve Lukather. So if he's listening, and I know he is, hi, Steve. Hi, yeah, hi, Luke. He doesn't answer to Steve. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's why I was, well, yeah, it's true. But I thought I could cover it in case he heard. And I was just, I'm talking to Steve Lawton. So, okay. so, sorry. Sorry about that whole gobbing on Toto thing if he is watching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that Toto is one of those bands that, uh, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And it's interesting to see how they've had a revitalization the past few years. And you could argue some of that's due to Weezer. Cuffing. And absolutely. I was going to say the R Rivers Cuomo connection, like he's uh, canonized them to the point where, and that brings us back to power pop somehow. It does. And Weezer is, is kind of a unique thing where I would say maybe the fourth generation of power pop. I'm making up generational numbers right here. Maybe the fourth generation of power pop. Everyone was inspired by Weezer, but that's a band that would go, we are not power pop. They would, they would never identify as being grunge, which they were pegged as the beginning or emo, which they were pegged or power pop. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another example of a shredding guitar player. Who's got an ear for hooks. Rivers is a shredding guitar player. That's a like good point. He, yeah. Very good point. Unleash. Um, that, you know, it, Paul mentioned it earlier, but Daniel Brummel, who wrote the piece about Weezer in our first book, which is called Is Weezer Power Pop? Mm -hmm. um, Daniel actually was in the band Ozma. Yes. And then through the association of uh, Ozma's association with Weezer, he was then in, in Weezer for a while. And yeah, I saw him play keyboards with live. Them. He co wrote yeah. a couple songs on that album uh, from like 2012, 2013. Yes. Yeah. And, but he, he even says, you know, what he does in his essay is really interesting. He goes, through every song on the blue record and gives it a percentage. You know, this one is 63% power pop. This one is 41% power pop. And he lands on that. They're not really a power pop fan, but you can hear the power pop in them. And it's something that power pop bands definitely respond to. Oh, can I just jump in and say, this is where I, uh, Steve will remember this. I've said this in a few interviews that to me, sometimes I look at power pop, not so much as a band's ideology as it's a genre a jacket you can wear and I, the, the analogy I make is is uh, rockabilly uh, we would never call queen a rockabilly band but they did crazy little thing called love right mm -hmm. and 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 if you think of it that way and rockabilly has the same thing too which they have a certain orthodoxy of you know a certain Gretsch guitar a certain kind of you know brushes on snares and stand-up bass and there's a there's a bunch of sort of uh, uh, totems, if you will, of of what a rockabilly song and power pop has elements too. And the example I give is Thirty Eight Special have mm. some of the greatest power pop songs that I yeah. know are by Thirty Eight Special. And you would not, you would not just say that. I mean, some people might say that Thirty Eight Special was a power pop band. I wouldn't, but I would say I see where that one is. You know, I see that song, and Weezer's, you know, Buddy Holly to me fits in with all the the great classic crunchy power pop songs i know but uh islands in the sun doesn't you know <laughs> or... that doesn't but there's songs on that record like photograph which is kind of power pop 101 or yeah. uh, don't let go the first song on that album also power pop 101 fourth generation we should say uh power pop per se. Yeah. but i'm curious another thing about this book is sometimes when you write about a particular subject you hear from the people that you wrote about, you know, feedback gets back to you. Whereas if you write about Van Halen, you're not going to hear from any members of Van Halen unless it's a cease and desist per se. Anyone give you feedback that was written about in the book that you're proud of? Uh, you know, can I just say that Burton Avare from The Knack really appreciated The Knack being on the cover of the second one. And then I heard from Doug Figer's uh, widow, I think. I actually, I can't remember. She's she was related to, Doug. oh, this is embarrassing. Maybe we don't put this out. But somebody associated with Doug Viger said that he, he, uh, he, uh, was he alive when we put the first book? Anyway, I, they, she, maybe yeah, they, they, they that, that way, here's what it is. Okay, now I'm embarrassed. But I think it was people who were associated with Doug Viger were really happy that we put the knack on the cover because they, they, they felt like it was the right, the right place to put them. And, and we put bad finger on the cover of the first one, which confused a lot of people too. But because like a lot of times people think that the book's all about whatever's on the cover. But um, but that picture of the knack to me was such a great 
example. This, this picture it's right such a great example of the energy of power pop and um, and a band that a lot of people would not would automatically understand why they're on the cover. And so when we got that chance to get that exclusive photograph, we did. And to have Burton from uh, who has just been banned from Twitter. But while we were on Twitter talking and I have his personal contacts now, but when we were talking on Twitter, he said, hey, I appreciate you doing that, which was uh, so that's a long, long answer. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah. No, thank you. That's that's a heck of a lot better. No, and we're waiting to hear uh, if yeah. anyone likes the book. Well, I've di I've yeah. disowned Eric Carmen, and I've been pretty public about that, so I don't know. If, he, if, I, <laughs> again on Twitter, I got uh, pinged by AC Newman um, from the New oh, Pornographers, cool. who was who had found out that um, a friend of mine had written a piece about him in the first book. Chris Holmes wrote a really excellent piece about AC Newman and the New Porn Pornographers, and. And uh, he pinged me on the Twitter and I was able to send him a copy of the book and he was really cool about it and thankful. He just wanted to like read the book. He's a, he's a power pop fan. Um, I've also heard from and gotten to know uh, Steve Allen, who's the lead singer of 2020. And that's the band I write about in the second book. If you're a power pop fan, you know all about 2020, but it's not a household name for most people, right? But like right. for me, getting to know Steve Allen and, and having him say that he loved my essay and that he loved the collection we put oh, together. that's great. Like, yeah. Oh my gosh, it's like, you know, heaven to me. Well, Steve, I have to ask the same question in a different way now, which is that which Chris Holmes is it that wrote about this? Because I don't think it was Chris Holmes from Wasp who wrote the, the essay. <laughs> no, no. He's a crime fiction author that I know from that side of my um, writing uh, community. So no, he's yeah. not the guy from Wasp. No. There's a few Chris Holmeses, a few Dave Holmeses, a few Kate yeah. Sullivan's. Yeah. Uh, some people they maybe should be Chris J Holmes or you know Chris yeah. not guy from Wasp Holmes. <laughs> yeah, I'll start. I'll start having him put not guy from Wasp as his middle name. I do want to say though that you know to your point about the knack being on the cover of the second book. For the first book, we did an event at a music store in the Valley, um, and we had people play, and we had a panel discussion, and it was it was a really great event. The guy who asked the most questions was the guy behind the counter named Tom Graychick. And he was asking questions from behind the counter of the panel, clearly a big power pop fan. I got to talking to him and he's like, listen, I've got all these unpublished photos from when I was going to school in Berkeley and this four year span of all these bands you're talking about. And so that's how we ended up with that cover shot and ended up with him doing a photo essay in the middle of the second book is because he's a fan and, and he approached us. Wow. Well, yeah. Paul, uh, we were talking before about your Todd Rundgren book. Uh, point blank, is Todd Rundgren a power pop artist on any level? On any level, yes. Uh, in, in fact, in many ways, uh, you know, I mean, he's certainly not limited to being a power pop artist, but he, he uh, especially with Naz, uh, and then I think on Something Anything, he pretty much invented one of the prototypes of power pop with a song called Couldn't I Just Tell You? which to me is, if that's, I mean, it, it, and it, it takes a lot from the who, which are true proto power pop. So, um, but all the elements of, and you can hear it in um, several Todd Rundgren songs. So and, but the thing about Todd is like, it, this is where it becomes pop is just a jacket you wear every so often because Todd also is an electronic pioneer and he's also a ballad guy. He did like a whole Carol King period where he was a piano ballad maker. Um, but you know, he, he, when he plays the guitar and he can also do bluesy stuff. So, but, yeah. but couldn't I just tell you is a great example of that. And, uh, and, oh, and uh, I saw the light, I think fits in the power pop. It's more in the pop than the power, but, um, it's, it's got all the elements of why you would like someone like an Emmett Rhodes say, you know, so the, there's that beetle aspect that runs through power pop and you can haggle about whether a song that is softer is still power pop. But, um, and people do, and frankly, that's one of the things we love about this party that we keep throwing is that uh, they're really, I, I think it's boring if you try to be definitive and don't allow for people to disagree. I mean, I had to learn that as a frustrated nerd for many years thinking, I wanna be right, you know, but uh, I guess that's part of the comfort of age is knowing that everyone's got an opinion and they're not always right or wrong. And it's fun, it's fun to talk. We love music, that's why we talk. Yeah, the people that love power pop are just so endlessly devoted. There's no casual power pop fans. You're either all in or you're not in. And so this book, in the best of ways, 
caters to that all in devoted fan base. So wholly has my recommendation, both volumes of it. Now, what's next? Uh, Steve, are, are you allowed to say what's next, what you're working on? Are you under deadline.com embargoes and publicists that, you know, have NDAs and that kind of stuff? No, uh, what's next is that that book that we mentioned earlier, Forbidden Beat Perspectives on Punk Drumming is actually being published February 8th of 2022. Thank you. Um, And so I'm doing a lot of uh, essay writing and interviews and gearing up sort of the uh, publicity machine around that. But I'm also talking to um, some bands about potentially helping them write their biography. So that probably in 2022, I'm going to turn my focus to uh, working with a band to help them write a biography. Awesome. And Steve Lukather is not on that list, correct? I, I, you know, I'm under NDA and can't say for sure. Um, can't deny or confirm. He's texting me now. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's Luke, he says. Anyway, um, that's, that's exciting, Steve. Yeah. Yeah, I think that goes down to the principle of good work leads to more work per se. Are you drumming at the moment or everything's going to the writing? No, actually, uh, because I'm a crazy person, um, I'm a dad and a, and a husband and I've got a full-time job and I'm writing books. And I also just released an album called Dose with a band called The Brothers Steve, which is an LA-based band on Big Stir Records. And actually, Darren, uh, it's three of the members of Czar. It's Jeff Whalen, Jeff Solomon, and myself. We were all in Czar with two of our friends, Oz Tyler and Dylan Champion, who wrote the GBB essay. Um, and we're playing basically power pop band called the Brothers wow. Steve. Yeah. Why, why isn't it called the Brothers Jeff? If there's so many Jeffs in the band. <laughs> well, it, this is how weird it is, right? So it's called the Brothers Steve because I'm the only Steve in the band. I'm not referred to as Steve. <laughs> I'm referred uh, to by a nickname so that there are no Steves in the band. Quick tangent. I was in a band once called the Steve Kyle Orchestra because we had originally had Steve Kyle in the band. Just, you wouldn't know the guy. And uh, and he kept not showing up for rehearsal. So we replaced him, but we decided to name the band after him. So that was just, uh, you know, when, you're, when you're 18, you do stuff like that. Oh, yeah, but, you could uh, do even worse than, than that. I, I think that when you grow up as a music fan, you realize that Jay Giles is not the singer in the Jay Giles band. No, uh, it was Jethro Tull, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just ben, kidding. Ben Folds Five, there's not five of them. Leonard Skinner was their PE teacher. He actually was. (laughs) But it was, wasn't it like Leonard Skinner? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Leonard Skinner. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it was. But when you're down there, it's Leonard Skinner. You know, Skinner, we can argue, has power pop tendencies to them. When you think of Gimme Three Steps and What's Your Um, Name and some of those. those I don't know. Well, I mean, that's certainly the roots of 38 Special right there. So, you know, so it's, there, whatever DNA strand was going through Skinner around that time. I think uh, Aerosmith, there's there's one, if you want to get into those ones. Um, a song like uh, Janie's Got a Gun uh, and Jaded. Jaded by Aerosmith is an XTC song, as far as I'm concerned. Just, uh, I will argue anyone on that. Well, if the, if... well look, you look at who really wrote those Aerosmith songs, o- allegedly. I'm, I'm going to say allegedly in case anyone okay. is, is listening. You know, most of the Aerosmith output from 85 forward will say Tyler Perry Fredrickson, Tyler Perry Martin. Desmond Tyler Child. Perry. Desmond yeah. Child is another one that comes up. Yeah. Yeah. Tyler and- Perry, who also plays Medea, which is fantastic. <laughs> yes. What a busy what guy. <laughs> what a busy guy. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, no, exactly. And uh, that's, and that's, that is, by the way, Steve and I have talked about this, I think one of the sort of, you know, guys like Mike Viola, who are great power pop guys, they make a living writing for things like Disney and being, being the song maker behind certain other person's things. And, you know, certainly uh, Mandy Moore has discovered the Mike Viola thing in, in her solo career. And there's there's a there's a sense that and Adam Schlesinger, God bless him, uh, was um certainly employed in other areas and, and that, you know, wherever the Fountains of Wayne's power pop side was, which I think he was more leaning towards that Correct. than Chris Collingworth. Um, the, you know, he funded his power pop by being uh, an all rounder outside of it. So those guys will show up in places to bring the tunefulness that other people might not have as naturally. 
Yeah. Right. And oh, yeah. another person who took that career path is actually Perry Grip from yes. Nerf Herder, who oh, yeah. started writing jingles and now writes for cartoons. But to bring it all the way back home, Darren, their big hit was about Van Halen and how they loved DLR and they were not so into Sammy Hagar. I have sent <laughs> Perry a couple of emails. Hey, I want to interview you about Roth. Huh. Haven't heard back, so this is a public shaming of. Can sorts. I just say that I sing "Baby Monkey" uh, of by uh, you know the "Baby Monkey, Baby yeah. Monkey, Riding on a Pig, Baby Monkey." It's an amazing. Harry's song. a he's a genius, and it seems like he can write anything in five minutes and make it go viral. But bringing you know a four topics into into one here, the Founds of Wayne song "Red Dragon Tattoo." Mm -hmm. There's the line: "I've got a 38 special CD collection." Some yeah. vaccine to prevent it. And they're going to see, uh, was it uh, uh, Kirk? Was it, they're, they see, they're about Metallica, right? They're James and Kirk and, and Laser Floyd, I think they're <laughs> talking about. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. and that's, and that's why we loved Adam, right? I mean, he, yeah. Adam, Adam was a full service pop consumer and, 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 and producer, but you know that he's, he's one of your, your people because he, he's just there for the tunes. He, he, he gets it. Like, and that's, I mean, not to bring it on a downer, but that's one of the saddest things I can think of. I knew him personally, and I think you did yes. too, Steve, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. it's just, it was just, um, I mean, yeah, I just want to say that, yeah, in, in this conversation, the ghost of Adam Schlesinger haunts the whole thing a little bit for me, because that, there's a guy who knew, he knew good power pop, but also had the sense to wear other jackets, you know, and, and, and that's, that's, you know, God bless Adam Schlesinger. That's all. Yeah. When I, you know, when I interviewed him for the piece I wrote about Fountains of Wayne in the first book, um, I had met him years previously and it was kind of reconnecting with him. He was so giving of his time and so smart and, and so passionate and talking about his music that it's actually this like really beautiful memory that I have. And, and when people connect with that essay, I, it really means a lot to me, right? Because he is this monster talent and I just want to tell everybody about him and that they should be paying more attention to him beyond sort of Stacy's mom, that like there's this whole body of work there. Stacy's mom is great, but there's this whole body of work there with Ivy, right? With, with mm. all the bands that he played with and anything that he put his hands on was just gold because he was so talented. The artist that you mentioned right before that, Paul, Mike Viola is somebody I worked with and through oh, yeah. him, I got to meet Adam a bunch. And when I was earlier in this conversation talking about how most of the people associated with power pop started off in that rock vein, you know, Mike Viola started off as a Ozzy Randy Rhodes kind of guy. You know, one of the times I was at his house, you know, he was taking out records and he put on a Vandenberg album, Adrian Vandenberg, who is in Whitesnake. And, and then I think he put on UFO Strangers of the Night after that. Uh, I find that a lot of the people start off with the British metal, the, the early hair metal kind of stuff. Then they discovered Squeeze and mm. the Knack and other stuff like that. I think we have a mutual friend, Steve, in Linus Dotson. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Linus is another one of those guys who went Judas Priest and then Jellyfish. I had a conversation <laughs> with Linus about Power Pop and um, he actually, I interviewed him and, and he said at one point, I know I'm going to get a lot of grief for this, but Bon Jovi is my Beatles. <laughs> That's he, interesting. He yeah. is very intense about Bon Jovi. It's yeah. not a, a joke. <laughs> here's, here's one, uh, Jason Faulkner, yes. who's also a friend of mine, but Jason Faulkner, when I saw him play solo in the bottom of the hill of San Francisco, he was doing Photograph by Def Leppard. It's a great and cover. You yeah. don't have to change a lot to make that a power pop song. No. You know, it's a power pop song as far as I'm concerned. And uh, a lot of Def Leppard actually is, is uh, could be considered, they, they lean into it a little bit more into the rockest, what we call rockest way. You know, it's how you dig in a certain way. And I think maybe power pops about weepy guys sometimes, sometimes, whereas uh, metal pop is often about sort of macho, you know? So there's, there's that macho needle, but you know, all of Def Leppard's influences are things like T-Rex and it's not like, you know, I think in England too, I wonder if England has more of a melting pot or less of a melting pot, but it seems like people grow up listening to everything from Gilbert O'Sullivan to, you know, um, speed metal and they can somehow, and hip hop too. And they somehow managed to like make original music. So I don't know, again, genres are limiting and I wish I was even less genre happy sometimes. Yeah. And 
you know, connecting all the dots here, we talked about Butch Walker before when the third Marvelous Three album was coming out and I interviewed him as a terrible 18 or 19 year old interviewer around then. He was jokingly saying how that third Marvelous Three album, they were thinking of calling P2K as in Pyromania 2000 based on their love of Def Leppard. In that era, 99, 2000, 2001, it was not cool to like Def Leppard. So it's interesting to see how a band like that is the biggest band in the world, then nothing and uncool, and then they're cool again and doing the best numbers of their whole careers, you know, all these years later, per se. Do we think, this is the last topic, a spitball thing, putting you on the spot here. Do you guys see any of the bands featured in this book as one day having that late career, post-career renaissance, the way that somebody like Rodriguez did? Like, do you see Big Star eventually one day getting that, that final share, that younger people get it? I, I think Big Star already did, right? Yeah, I, think I think starting so in the 80s, there was this revival around them and, and it's been man- maintained now so that like Big Star's canon right? Like people listen to Big Star because of bands like R.E.M. and The Replacements and because successive bands who like those bands have kind of waved that flag around September Girls, right? And I'm in love with the girl. Um, I actually do think, and it's too early to be happening now, I actually think Fountains of Wayne will have a bigger footprint and a a bigger legacy than people are aware of down the road. Like for example, uh, just this weekend, I've been flipping out, and this is this is what it's like to be a power pop fan, right? I discovered this band from Philadelphia called Second Grade, and I spent four hours yesterday just listening to their back catalog on Bandcamp, right? I'm this huge fan. I like discovered them. I listened to the record. I bought the vinyl. I friended them on Twitter, right? Like <laughs> immediately, I'm into this band. And what I was responding to in their music is that they seem to be unabashed fans of Fountains of Wayne. And that's the way it's going to get carried forward is bands paying homage because they love Fountains of Wayne's music. And yeah. I think we will see Fountains of Wayne's reputation and legacy grow over the next decade or so. It, it occurs to me before I let Paul weigh in and stop talking way too much uh, that Katy Perry covered Hackensack by Fountains of Wayne for her yeah. MTV Unplugged. I don't know if right. she also did it live otherwise, but maybe that's the sort of thing that does make some of these bands live on that somebody way too famous spotlighting a song. But what were you going to say, Paul? No, I was just going to say that, um, you know, not that we've decided that Todd isn't, Rungren isn't necessarily power pop, but, you know, when a band like Lemon Twigs, mm. uh, uh, you know, are constantly talking about, you know, they, they, they're really into bands like that and they're really into chamber pop. And they're really into so like things like Emmett Rhodes, I think, would come around again. Um, uh, I don't know what happens there. And again, I if I was a good gambler, I'd have a lot more money, but I, I can't make bets on these things because you never know. But I think that seeing how XTC, for instance, have, have gained a lot of at least street cred in some ways, XTC are the big star of you know contemporary music because there's a lot of bands now who and you know the catalogs there. You know, you could just find all the XTC albums right away. And, um, you know, in the old days, it was harder. It was harder to find stuff. Like, I remember when I got into Big Star, it had to be on a cassette. Somebody snuck them in on some other thing. And I said, which one? Which one's this? I don't know. Because I didn't, I don't think, no one knew Big Star when they were happening other than certain rock critics. Right. I was a Bad Finger fan, but really only the singles, you know. And, uh, I mean, I knew Come and Get It. And I knew, you know, uh, No Matter What and Day After Day. And um, but I it was only later I discovered the album. So I think things things do take a while. And you're right. Some younger, hipper person will either do a cover or start talking about them, uh, the influence, you know, the way like Laura Nero, for instance, not Power Pop, but Laura Nero's influence shows up in, you know, younger women artists who who uh, they might have discovered Judy Sill that way and the same thing. And you hear suddenly people mentioning a name that maybe hasn't been mentioned in the mainstream. And then you'll get people saying that they were always into those things. <laughs> That's what happened with Big Star. People were going, I was listening to Big Star in 73. No, you weren't. You know, like, I mean, some people were. I think, you know. Have you seen um, the the Kiss interviews where Paul Stanley goes, yes, and that was inspired by Big Star. And you go, no, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that happens. Although he was a huge Raspberries fan. So, I mean, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think what Steve said is right about Fountains of Wayne. 
I, I, I wonder if, um, yeah, I wonder if Jellyfish are a band that could be um, cross generational, and uh, you know, and Emmett Rhodes, I think maybe you know as well. And you know, just I mean, it'd be nice if I don't know. I can't I can't think of like the Shivers having a renaissance, or I you know maybe maybe um, twenty twenty, and maybe the records, you know, but they didn't leave enough of a catalog of the records, I feel like, you know, so. Well, I think too, Teenage Fan Club is another band that I think could have another wave of fans yeah. coming up and discovering their music. That's and then a if good you point. discover- And Teenage Matthew Sweet Fan too. Club, yeah. yeah, Matthew Sweet for sure. But if you discover Teenage Fan Club, you automatically also discover 30 years of the music they liked as well. And that's the beautiful thing about these that's bands. That's true. It's a prism, you know? It's a, And Prism from Canada is another <laughs> band that, um, do you know, I actually, I, I touched on this very at the beginning here, but yeah, I was um I was a guy who liked Rush because they were the the band next door that made good. Yeah. I always say that if you grew up in North York, uh, Canada, it, it, imagine being a Run DMC fan from Hollis Queens. You just felt like Run DMC were part of Hollis Queens. Well, Rush were my neighborhood rock band, and uh, they were like I, I, they were older than me, but we they were you know representing. And, and we felt we felt like Rush were, you know, guys like us, you know, they grew up on the same streets as us. Did, so didn't so, that but, same area, I have to cut you off before I forget this. Didn't the reggae artist Snow also come from that same area? <laughs> he did, but he was yeah, he's okay. younger than me. But yeah, Informer was his big hit. Uh, I, I interviewed Snow and I uncovered that he was a huge Kiss fan. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, well, guys like him probably. <laughs> They were probably wearing like had metal hair and maybe their drug dealer was Jamaican or something. And then they went, what's this music? Oh, I like uh, allegedly, something on, allegedly something on, like toaster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I wanted to point the point I was making about Rush was in interviews, Getty and Alex and maybe even Neil were talking about Yes and Genesis as being things that they were into and also talking about some of the blues artists the way Led Zeppelin did. And I went Oh, what are Genesis? And yes, this was how early that was. And so suddenly I was I was hearing, uh, you know, selling England by the pound. And and that kind of got me deeper into other. And this is the power of artists talking about other artists. And if you're listening to them and they tell you what they're listening to, if you get curious, if a Todd Rundgren fan checks out Laura Nero, then, you know, then there's there's kind of a lineage there. And that's that's exciting. That's all I'm going to say about that. Well, no, I think I think that's definitely true of like what the replacements did very vocally for Alex Chilton and Big Star and yes. what they did very vocally for the New York Dolls. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a good, absolutely good point. Well said. Well, both of you can't thank you enough for your time. Can I just plug writing. my can I just plug my podcast? Please plug wanna, that yeah. and the books. <laughs> so I, I am working on a book about John Candy, the comedian, because I wrote a book about the kids in the hall. And uh, and it seems like comedy is something that I can write about. So <laughs> I was actually asked to write a book about John Candy, which will come out in about a year or so. And but I'm also I just wrote an executive produced um, a documentary about a, about ca some Canadian comedy uh, things that I can't describe yet. But it's uh, we're going to make the announcement really soon. So I was working on a documentary this year, and that's an area that I'd like to get into more. So and that and the Record Store Day podcast every two weeks at all available podcast outlets. That's it. Thanks for my plugging. Yeah, Renaissance you guys are working on such better things than most of the people I interview. I, that can be printed publicly and are so modest about it and so knowledgeable about all these uh, topics. Stop, so, stop. so the He's praise honest. continues. Yeah. <laughs> I look forward to those. Uh, Steve, the the collection of Greg Salem, the punk rock PI, continuing. Uh, it was a trilogy uh, kind of ended with him going to prison. So we'll see if he gets out of prison at some point. <laughs> well, if you need any research related to the PI stuff, yeah. <laughs> come to an actual licensed PI and we'll take it yeah. from there. But thank you both for the great work you do for your time and just looking forward to everything to come. Darren, thank you so much pleasure. for having yeah. us on the show. It's a, a really fun conversation, uh, but just inviting us on and, and giving us the time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Darren. It. Yeah, thanks a lot. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Steve. Uh, and you too, Paul. One day this we will see each other. Only time we ever get to see each yeah. other. <laughs> As they say in Spinal Tap, have a good time all the time. All the time. time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Talk soon. Yeah. See you. Bye. Outro cast. <laughs>